Hello students, welcome to another video lecture for ComSci 125 operating systems. In this chapter, we're going to talk about uh, address translation. In the previous chapter, we talked about the memory API, wherein we studied the malloc function and uh, the different errors that programmers commit when they use this malloc function to allocate memory on the heap section of a process's address space. This chapter is about the mechanism of uh, address translation. The idea of virtualizing memory is to provide uh, some form of efficiency and control and also flexibility. Memory virtualizing takes a similar strategy known as the limited direct execution uh, in the same manner that we virtualize the CPU. In memory virtualizing, efficiency and control are attained by uh, hardware support. So uh, this is required. The uh, address translation that we will discuss later will require some hardware support, which include uh, registers, translation block size buffers, and page tables. In order to provide flexibility, uh, we allow the processes to be able to use their address space in whatever way they like. So we provide an illusion to the processes that they have access to the full uh, address space or to, to, the, uh, all, uh, to all the physical memory available on the computer. Now let's now focus on the address translation itself. By now you know already that a process's view of the address space is in the form of virtual addresses and these virtual addresses are translated or transformed into physical addresses. Physical addresses are the actual physical location in the main memory. Now, in order to perform address translation, uh, the OS must get involved at uh, key points to set up the hardware. Remember that in order to achieve uh, efficient and controlled memory virtualization, we need some hardware support. And the OS must, at some point, uh, uh, perform some initialization and set up um, additional data structures and hardware components in order to achieve the flexibility, control, and efficiency objectives presented earlier. Now, in this chapter, we make the following assumptions. The first one is that uh, the user's other space is placed contiguously in physical memory, meaning all the sections of a process's other space, the code, the data, the stack, the heap, they are located contiguously in physical memory. Second assumption that we will make is that the address space is not too big. And we assume here that the address space is less than the size of the physical memory. And the third assumption is that the address space size for all processes are the same. So we have, let's say, if we allocate 4 kilobyte or 16 kilobyte for the address space of the process, all processes in the system will have that same size. Let's take a look at an example of address translation. The basic idea is to translate virtual addresses to physical addresses. 
here we have an example C code. We have a function uh, func, and then we have a local variable x, and this is set to 3000, and x is incremented by 3. Now, in this uh, example code, there are actually several steps involved in this uh, short code fragment. One is the loading of a value from memory. Second is incrementing it by three. And then lastly, storing the value back into the memory. So it involves three instructions uh, on the hardware part, load, increment, and store. This would be the example generated assembly code for that C code fragment. So you have the move instruction for the x86 ISA. Then we have the add instruction for incrementing. This is the constant three added to EAX. And then this is the store instruction, which is basically just the move instruction. Okay, so here uh, we presume that the address of x has been displayed in has been placed in the EBX register, and loading the value of that address into EAX register. So, uh, what I'm showing here in the slide is ATMP syntax. So, uh, this is the source. This is the destination, and then adding 3 to EAX, so this will be adding 3 to EAS, and then lastly storing the value in EAX back to uh, the variable X. Let's take a look at uh, those instructions and how they will affect the uh, memory access and the address translation process. So again, we are dependent on the assumptions, three assumptions given earlier. So as you can see here, we have the processes uh, address space. This is 16 kilobytes in total. We have the program code. We have the heap. We have the stack. Okay. So assuming that those three instructions are in the code section, program code, this will be the addresses in the particular memory section, so 128, 132, and 135. So these are the memory addresses of the instructions. When executing uh, this uh, code, okay, what will happen is that there will be a fetch at address 128. Remember the fetch decode execute cycle. So we have fetching of the instruction at address 128, which is in the code section. Then uh, this instruction will be executed. And it says here that uh, the variable x is referenced by EVX. So take note. In this example, since in our code x is a local variable, it will be placed uh, in the stack. As shown here, the variable x is located at address 15 kilobyte on the stack. So it will execute this instruction. Uh, this uh, move, which actually load from address 15 KB, and the value will be placed in AX. After that, the instruction pointer will move to the next instruction, which is at address 132, and then it will execute that instruction. There is no memory reference instruction because it will only perform addition, which is an arithmetic operation. 
then it will proceed to the next instruction, which is fetching the instruction at address 135. This one will have a store instruction, so store to address 15 KB. So the output or the result is not shown here, but essentially what will happen is that the value of 15 KB will eventually be replaced by 3000 KB. So this is how the three instructions generated in the previous code will be executed and outlined here are the memory references that will happen during the execution of these instructions. So again, remember that at this point, we are working in the virtual address space. Now, an interesting question that might arise is address space relocation. The process's view of its virtual address space is from 0 to 16 kilobytes, shown here. 0 to 16 kilobytes. It might be the case that this maps exactly to physical memory. So remember that we have an assumption that a process's address space should be less than the size of the physical memory. Now, in the best case scenario, it's possible that uh, this address space maps directly to the physical memory. But normally that is not the case because the operating system will usually take the first few megabytes of memory for itself. So usually processes will be loaded, the address space of the processes will be allocated somewhere above the operate the memory being used by the operating system. Now let's say the OS wants to place the process somewhere else in physical memory, not exactly at address zero, because let's say the OS is occupying that area. So to have an illustration, let's say this is the If this is the virtual memory, this is the physical memory. If there is a direct mapping from virtual memory to physical memory, then we can have something like this direct mapping. But normally in a typical system, the OS will be occupying this area. So they will load the processes somewhere, some location X, and it will be mapped somewhere at location Y in the physical memory. Okay, so this is a better illustration. So the idea of uh, relocating process is like this. So you have the, this is the address space of the process or the address space. And then we have this physical memory. By relocation, we mean that this is the view of the process when it comes to its uh, uh, virtual address space. But in the actual physical memory, it's located at memory location 32 kilobytes instead of zero kilobytes. And you can also see here that some areas are not used. Now, how do we achieve this relocation? This mechanism to allow a virtual other space to be mapped to a different location in the physical memory. So we have a, te a technique called dynamic relocation, which is hardware-based, and this involves additional 
hardware support, specifically the use of additional registers, namely base and bounce registers. This is how it will look like. So the hardware will have to provide these registers. And what will happen is that during the address translation process, a virtual address will be fed into a memory management unit. And that virtual address will be uh, evaluated and analyzed. And then a specific uh, base register will be used. So let's say in this case, 32 KB. And then the bounce register, which is the size of the process's address space. And uh, these registers will be used to perform the translation or the relocation process. The way it works is that uh, a program is written and compiled as if it is loaded uh, at address zero, like this uh, typical illustration shows. When the program starts running, the OS will decide where in physical memory a process should be loaded. So what it does is to set the base register to a value and the actual physical address will be the virtual address plus the uh, base address or the value stored in the base register. Every virtual address must not be greater than bound and not negative. So the, this is the constraint. Every memory reference should not exceed the bounds set in the bounds register. Let's take a look at this example. So this is the code earlier. So what will happen is that there is a fetch, uh, there's a fetch instruction at address 128. Now, if the base register is set to 32 KB, then the actual physical address will be 128 plus 32 KB, which is the base address. Okay, so this will be the actual location on the physical memory. Remember that 1 KB equals 24, 1024 bytes. Okay. Then it will execute this instruction and this instruction will perform a load from address 15 KB. So again, to get the physical address, we add the address on the virtual address space, which is 15 AB, plus the base address specified in the base register. So that's uh, how to compute the physical address given the value in the base register and the offset on the uh, virtual address space. There are actually two ways to define the bounce registers. Uh, the bounce register, the first one is it can be treated as the size of the address space, let's say 16 kilobytes. So this will be the size, the bounce register can be treated as such. Or it can actually be treated also as the physical address of the end of the address space. So in this case, the bounce register is treated as 48 KB because we have 32 plus 16, 
that will be 48 and the bonds register is set to the uh, end of the address space for the particular process. Let's take a look at some examples of translation. Let's say we're given a process with the address space size of four kilobytes and loaded at physical address 16 kilobytes. So this means that this will be the base address. in the physical memory. So translations would look like this. If we have a virtual address zero, then uh, that will be loaded at physical address 16 KB. If we have one KB, then that will be loaded at 17 KB because we have 16 plus one, that's 17 KB. If we have 3,000, then that will be 16 KB plus 3,000, which is 19348. But if we have an address in the virtual address space of 4,400, there will be a fault because the size of our address space is only 4 kilobytes which is actually 4096 and 4400 is greater than 4096. So the operating system will issue a, an error or an exception, actually, the more technical term. Now this slide summarizes the hardware support needed for dynamic relocation. As I mentioned earlier, we need two additional registers. We have the base register and the bounds register. In addition to the presence of a kernel mode and user mode uh, in the processor, which is determined by a processor status word or PSW or sometimes it's just a control register. Changing the base and bounds register should be allowed only in kernel mode, okay? Because we cannot let user processes to change the value of the base register and the bounds register in user mode. So changing this value should be allowed only in kernel mode in particular when the scheduler switches to a new process. And the processor should be able to generate exceptions during illegal memory access as shown here. Exceptions or faults. So this table here summarizes the hardware requirements, privilege mode, base and bounds register, ability to translate a virtual address and check if it is within bounds. So this is part of the memory management unit hardware component, privilege instructions to update the base and bounds register, privilege instruction to register exception handlers. Usually this is done at boot time and ability to place exceptions. Let's take a look at some of the issues that the OS must address for, must address for dynamic application. So the OS must take action to implement the base and bounds approach. And what are the scenarios when the OS must uh, take charge. There are actually four critical junctures. The first one is when a process starts spanning. So when we load a process, the OS must find a space for the address space in physical memory 
Uh, usually they maintain a free list, which we will discuss in the next chapter. Also, when a process is terminated, when a process is terminated, uh, all the resources associated to a process, including its address of space, must be reclaimed okay, by the operating system in order to be used by other processes coming into the system. Third, when a context switch occurs. So when a context switch happens, as uh, I mentioned here, right, the OS should take charge of saving and uh, storing the base and bound register pair so that a process will be able to get back to its execution state when it's scheduled again by the scheduler. The main reason is that see, we only have one in this in this setup we only have one base and bound register pair. And lastly at boot time the OS must set exception handlers using privilege instructions like uh, setting up the exception handlers for illegal memory access. So let's take a look at an example here. So when the process starts running, the OS must find a room for a new address space. So usually we have a free list. So we have this free list. So this contains the starting addresses in the physical memory where a process can be placed or non-empty. So in this example, 32 is already taken, but 16 and 60, uh, 16 and 48 are not yet taken, so they can be used by the OS to place uh, a new process in these areas. When the process is terminated, looking at this uh, scenario, we have process A occupying this memory area in the physical memory. When this process terminates, the operating system will add this memory location back again to the free list to indicate that it is no longer used and we have three uh, slots available. When a context switch occurs, the OS must be responsible for installing the uh, base and base and bound sphere for uh, a process that will be removed from the CPU. So during the context switch, right, these values will be stored in the PCB of process A. So since process A will be interrupted, if we place in, in this uh, PCB, and then a new base will be set to the base and bound spare to the new process to be executed on the CPU. So here are other issues when it comes to the limited direct execution with dynamic relocation at the time. We discussed this uh, flow when we talk about CPU virtualization. We just modify it here to insert some additional steps in order to support dynamic relocation. At the good time, uh, we recall that the OS should set up a trap table, and these are the things that must be included in the in the trap table, the handlers for these events. Now, since you are implementing dynamic relocation, we need to add additional uh, handlers called exception handlers for illegal memory access and illegal instruction execution. Then we start the timer interrupt, and then the hardware will uh, click, and then it will interrupt at x milliseconds, and then 
it will transfer control to the OS again to initialize the process table, initialize the free list, because the free list will be used to contain, we will have a, a list of available spaces in the physical manner. So in the previous, this one is uh, at boot time. And let's take a look at runtime. So at runtime, this is the time when a process will be executed. So let's say a process is selected, process A, to be allocate memory on the process table. Then uh, we set the base and bound register for that particular process. So remember we have the uh, this uh, process knowing only its uh, virtual address space. So once set, the there will be a return from prop into A, then uh, the hardware will restore the registers of A, switch to user mode, and then jump to the initial program counter of process A. Then user mode, the process uh, will run, and let's say it fetches an instruction, then it will, the hardware will translate that virtual address to the physical address, and then it will perform the fetch, and then uh, it will execute the instruction. And if there is an explicit load or store, we ensure that we check the location or the address if legal, and then that translation will happen, and then performing the load and store, and then A runs again. Then when the timer interrupts, uh, the processor will move to kernel mode, and then uh, call the timer interrupt handle. Then this is the time when the scheduler will have to decide if a new process will be run. So let's say uh, the scheduler decided to stop A and run B. So it will call the switch function, the context switch function, which will save the registers of process A to the process table structure or PCV. This time, including the base and bounds registers associated to that process, and then it will rest restore the registers and the bounds registers, uh, base and bounds register for process B, and continue the process, and the same flow will happen as in the case with process A in this slide. Another issue when it comes to dynamic delegation is internal fragmentation. So what happens is if you have uh, dynamic relocation, uh, not all space allocated is actually used. Okay, so let's take a look, a look at this uh, slide, right? So if a process at this space is, in this case, 16 kilobytes, it's possible that not all of the spaces allocated in this area will be used okay, by the process because the process may not allocate memory from the heap or it may not use the stack all the time. So. This is basically a waste. Why did we allocate uh, this uh, large memory uh, uh, virtual address space for this process when some of, some of it or most of it will not be used? So that scenario is uh, uh, that uh, yes, that scenario is called internal fragmentation, and that's actually a problem when we have dynamic allocation. So uh, this will uh, end this chapter, and we're going to talk about uh, 
how to solve internal fragmentation in the next chapter.